record to my cloud or yours? I guess yours. Uh, my cloud. It, it, we're in my account, so it's going to record to my cloud, which is good. We're done. We're done. You can and I think it. we're all set there. And I think Gil can make someone a co-host as well. So I can, he, I can do that. And Jerry, leave your hat on. Precisely. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Good. I just want to show you guys. I just want to show you guys this place because this is the most beautiful retreat center I've ever seen. Where oh, I'm, I'm now leaving Wi-Fi, so this is danger. But here's one of the buildings on the premises. Basically, where are you? Where are you? I'm, I'm in Baja, California, and El, El Pescadero is the, the nearest town. So we're, um, we're an hour and a half west, back up the peninsula from Los Cabos, which are two towns at the bottom called, you know, basically um, Cabo is two towns that are kind of twins. Yep. And we're at a place called the Modern Elder Academy. Oh, uh, run by Chip Conley. And Chip is the guy who founded the Joie de Vivre Hotels, which grew to 52 hotels. Yeah. And he sold that. Then he was the um, chief uh, hospitality officer for Airbnb for several years and wound up becoming a, like an elder mentor for them. Right. And that kind of catalyzed him to buy a property. And uh, the, the design of this property is astonishing. So if you, if you have a group, um, he's got 25 rooms here. So maybe up to 50 people, but um, there's four different buildings. Uh, it's unbelievably well done. Yeah. Just to tag on to that very briefly, the thing he learned, quote, as the mentor at um, Airbnb was that the young people were mentoring him. And he learned from more from that experience than anything than anything else. And he wrote a book about that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And um, and he's the, the a, group that's here is the Silicon Guild. Yeah. Pardon? He's, he's done a bunch of books, very thoughtful, insightful, good stuff. Emotional Equations is one of them. Yeah. Um, he, so the group that's here is a group that April is a member of called Silicon Guild, which is a bunch of uh, authors of books. So it's really about writing books and, and that kind of thing. Hmm. Um, and I was going to say something else, but I'm forgetting. Uh, anyway. Jerry, please, please give him my best regards and tell him we were just telling that we were just talking about him yesterday. So oh, we'll do. I will Enjoy. totally do that. Yeah. Enjoy. Oh, I, I just remember what I was going to say. Um, yeah. So to the to your comments just a moment ago, uh, Chip kind of started calling himself a mintern, which was like a mentor who's also an intern, because that's what he wound up doing, like walking around, sort of learning the business and being behaving like an intern, even as he was a, an elder uh, sort of mentoring. So. Um, and I'm going to drop off and leave it to you guys to go wherever you'd like to go. Have fun. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Enjoy. Bye bye. Enjoy. Bye. Okay, now what? <laughs> that is the question, isn't it? I was, now what? I was, yeah, yeah. I was curious about who was going to show up today without Jerry's uh, leadership. <laughs> what would All the experimentalists? <laughs> well, you know what we say in open space: whoever comes is the right people. <laughs> So what, what is Chip's last name? I didn't catch that. Connolly. Connolly. C-O-N-L-E-Y. Mm -hmm. So I have, have more books to read. Which of his books do you recommend most highly, Gil? Um, uh, I haven't read any of them, so I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I think I breezed through his book about, you know, mentoring or whatever he calls it. That's true. I, I, I did. I, I read one of them. Which one was it? The equations. The was it the one with equations? Is that it? I've read one of them, but not personally. We always hear about emotional quotient, you know, EQ, but I, I've never actually seen anybody who's done rigorous assessments. I mean, it's not like IQ where they think they can actually measure something oh, based there, on a the, test. Mm -hmm. Is there somebody who's designed a uh, a methodology to decide that somebody has more EQ than somebody else? Yes. Um, there's There are some assessment instruments. As a matter of fact, the small consultancy that I have an affiliation with just asked if I wanted to um, debrief and coach people on the results of the their EQ assessment. And I look at I looked at the EQ assessment, and my mind just went, no, 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 no. It, it, the level of technical detail that they drilled down into was just, you know, insanity. It was like economic formulas. And I said, no, I don't think I don't even think I'm going to read 
your assessment, let alone debrief it and oh, you haven't you haven't taken it yourself just no. to uh -uh, absolutely. Stuart, what do they, Stuart, what do they claim they are measuring? EQ. Mm -hmm. what, what's the Q mean? Well, that's the question, isn't it? <laughs> well, <laughs> emotional emotional quotient EQ. What, I don't know what that means. Okay. Oh, you haven't heard so, the term. So I, I, um, I've heard the term. I don't know what it means. A guy by the name of Dan, serious here. Right. A guy by the name of Daniel Goleman, yeah. who is a psychologist and researcher at Harvard, from the '90s on, has written a whole bunch of books about EQ. Um, well, and and essentially, lie, no? essentially, the five 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 main elements of EQ: um, self knowledge and self awareness. Sometimes those two get lumped in together. Self knowledge, self awareness. That's that's kind of one. Number two, um, self regulation, the ability to manage your own emotions. Um, number three, um, self motivation what's important to you in life and your capacity to go after it. So those are all inward facing. And then the two that are external facing or outward facing is, is empathy, um, number four. And number five is kind of um, um, social skills, ability to form teams, to manage conflict, to create relationships, da 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 da, -da. And, and that's what his articulation of emotional intelligence is. Mm -hmm. Which isn't bad. No, 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 no. There's nothing, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. Matter of fact, in his own cosmology, within the last few years, and I think he's written a, a book about this, he's moved off of, quote, emotional intelligence into social intelligence, thinking that that's more um, important than in some ways an integration of the inward facing um, concepts. It's also probably easier to measure. <laughs> do they do self-assessment? Do they ask you questions? You know, how often do you get in a fight with your spouse? <laughs> you know, I, I'm yeah, I'm sure they do. I just, you know, I don't know why. I've I've always been kind of turned off by by trying to measure the immeasurable um, and and create little boxes mm -hmm. um, that just don't don't. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 laugh I'm, love. <laughs> I, I, I'm with you, Stuart. And my reaction to EQ was partly that. Uh -huh. And partly the quotient didn't tell me anything until you explained that it's about measuring emotional intelligence, which is the name of Goldman's book, which I did recognize as having heard emotional quotient, uh, which which is an expression of the problem that you and I have with measuring these things. Because you know, if you can not only measure them, but also make quotients of the things that you measure that you can't measure, that's yeah. a mess. Yeah, yeah. As if, you know, as if it was a, as if it was a quote, as if it was a science, you know. Well, the worst or, part of it is they're modeling it on IQ tests, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. If you're you gonna know, make an analogy or a metaphor to something that exists, you know, at least pick something that hasn't caused a great deal of harm and, uh, <laughs> Next, yeah, and to me, you know, some of these things boil down to oh, someone wanted to invent something so they could make more money or have more visibility or be seen as an expert in a certain area, as opposed to something that's of you know real intrinsic um, value. The book is the new business card, and without a book, you can't go on the Stephen Colbert show. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I think tests are useful, though. The Myers-Briggs test in particular is so simple and straightforward. And you That's get a bullshit. result that you then can talk to other people about. It's yeah. total bullshit, though. It is it total has bullshit. No, it has no grounding in science. It's <laughs> the Forer effect, the Barnum effect. And I, people go, you can't I, talk to me like that. I'm in this. It's like, and every time I take it, I come out as an OMFG. So I don't know what to say about that. But <laughs> <laughs> I've taken it four times and gotten three different results. But I, I've never if you seen want something that's setting, grounded in you get you get this, you know, oh you people, <laughs> it, it's just it's a language, it's it's a box in which people can drop themselves. If you want something that's yeah. really useful, look at the big five. Um mm -hmm. it's also known as canoe. Let's see, there's conscientiousness, openness to experience, neuroticism, um, extroversion, and um what was one other um sorry, it's escaping me, but um 
that's that's been normalized over tens of thousands of people. It comes out of positive psychology. It really looks at what are the di the dimensions of humans that that we um, inhabit. And I think I put a, a book in the chat for you. It's called um, How Emotions Are Made: The Secret Life of the Brain by Lisa Feldman Barrett. I've been reading it now for over a month. It is fantastic. It will definitely challenge a lot of what you think you know about emotions, like the fact that there's no such thing as an emotional fingerprint. You cannot tell what someone is experiencing by looking at them or their tone of voice. Um, there is no single emotional um, uh, fingerprint anywhere. Um, it, emotions are what, what's known as population thinking. So variation is the norm. Somebody who's angry might smile. Somebody else who's angry might yell. Somebody else who's angry might just be really quiet. Someone else who's angry might leave the room. So there's no one size fits all. And I'm now at, towards the end of the book, she's talking about emotions in the legal system, and it's really fascinating. Um, there have been studies that show that judges before lunch mistake um, their hunger for guilt, and they sentence people to much harsher sentences right before lunch. So you want to have your sentencing after lunch, you know, um, and judges always say, oh, we're impartial. And it's like, this, the neuroscience does not back that up. It is impossible to be impartial. Everyone is subject to interoceptive and affective experiences. And this it's a myth. So it's it's really, and it's just a superb, super Lurton book. It's very, very accessible. She talks about a lot of te technical stuff in very accessible language. So I highly recommend that. Yeah. Cool. So you just, you just triggered so many things, um, Ken. And this is probably about seven, eight, nine years ago. I was at a two-day training at Cal um, Law School, also known as Bolt Hall or previously known as Bolt Hall. I was teaching there as an adjunct, but they had a two or three day seminar on meditation for attorneys and over 200 attorneys there. One of the speakers was a guy by the name of Michael Zimmerman, who was the former chief judge of the Utah Supreme Court. And he got up and said, you know, this notion that we're impartial from the bench, that's just bullshit. <laughs> it's total bullshit. You've got to know a little bit about where your biases lie so that you can factor those in in any kind of rulings you make, including the whole notion of, 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 um, uh, of what time of day it is and what's going on inside of you at that moment in time. Um, insight inventory is an instrument that I use. It's very down and dirty for you know, working with, 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 with other people is short and simple. And um, I designed an instrument for um, uh, America, ASTD, which is now American Society for Training, probably 15 years ago. And it's an assessment instrument about um, the generative capacity of an organization. I never wanted to nor had any interest in statistically validating it or using it as a measuring tool. But when I work with groups, I will often use it just as a conversation starter to get people talking about why they, they evaluated certain phenomenon in certain ways, just to get people aware of what's going on and how different people see different things in the organization. I think instruments are great conversation starters. They, they, they can drive you into that deeper introspective conversation. But the idea of you know statistical validation for all the reasons that Ken talked about in terms of emotions, I don't think is of great value. Yeah, my two cents. Gil, sorry to jump ahead of you. Mm -hmm. No worries. Take Forty-five cents. Yeah, uh, uh, Ken's mouth was going faster than my mind was for a while. Or so. <laughs> It goes faster than mine sometimes too. <laughs> yeah. So I'd love to see that generative capacity instrument. And I agree with you on, on the role and value of instruments. So thank you for that. Um, Ken, um, geez, <clears throat> you rattled off five things and referring to it as an it, 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 but I don't know what the re referent was on that. Oh, the big five, big five personality uh, traits. Go to, I'll, I'll dig it up for you right now. Hold on a second. Is that, is that a known thing called the big five? It is a known thing called the big five. Wow. Okay. Or canoe, um, you said, right? Canoe, so, canoe or ocean. Um, okay. Because I think if you do big five, you also get the five largest wildlife of Africa. And there's a bunch of different terms. So there's the, there's the Wikipedia link for it. So you okay. have um, openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. Um, 
And that's the big five of what? What's the heading on that? It's called the big five personality traits. Personality traits. Yeah. And this is, um, it, it's a suggested taxonomy for grouping personality traits developed from the 80s onward on, that, based in psychological less, trait theory. Is that less bullshit than Myers-Briggs and everything else? Much more or less bullshit because it's actually grounded in, in scientific observation. I mean, we're talking well, about subjective well, stuff, so we have to have some fuzziness there. It's a social science, not a hard science. But is it, is it cross culturally validated? I believe it is. Um, I'm skeptical, but thank you. Um, let me take a look here. Um, the initial model was advanced in '58. Uh, didn't really reach research as a scientist of the '80s. Um, at least four sets of researchers have worked independently to reflect on the traits for decades and have and identified the same five factors. Ken, Ken, it's not helpful to have you be reading from Wikipedia. All right. Thank you. Go ahead and read it yourself. <laughs> I will do that. Thank you for the link. The other thing on the cross-cultural validation, I had a friend who years ago was doing cross-cultural work in Bay Area hospital systems. Uh, and he talked about being in hospitals where there were people from like you know, 37 different nationalities. Uh, and they found that not only were affects and language and so forth difference, but in in you know in some cultures when people would say would nod this way for no. Mm -hmm. And so you can imagine the massive confusion that would result when people are trying to coordinate activities like, will you do this? Right? So yeah, so color me skeptical about cross-cultural validation of social phenomena. So this and says that they've been, it's been. It, you, cannot, you cannot tell what somebody else is thinking, feeling. Um, I, what's been showing up a lot in my coaching lately is the phenomenon of uh, of people making assessments of other people's assessments of them. And it gets very, it's, you know, turtles all the way down messy. But we assume we know what's going on. L last thing I want to say about this is that my uh, mentor, Brian Franklin, used to say that the most powerful person in any room is the person who's most emotionally flexible. And I don't have any experimental validation for that, but it struck me as very powerful. That's it. Doug C. I would agree with that last statement completely, Gil. Mm -hmm. um, no fixed boundaries. In other words, just kind of um, the ability to be present to what someone else is saying or feeling um, without levels of fixed boundaries. I mean, this starts to get into the metaphysics of stuff. Um, and, and it was a a real big learning moving from being a practicing attorney to, to a mediator to be able to not advocate for something but just to be a a clear open presence for what was going on um in front of you there's uh, directly related to that um at ibm we did executive training and one of the things that we did was the Herman Brain Dominance Index Test, which is, I think, a much more effective way of assessing your intellectual and emotional strengths than Myers-Briggs. And IBM had been using it for 30 years. So they had like half a million people who had taken this test and a lot of very important correlations. And I, I think I've mentioned to the group, at least some of you, that, that uh, there were four categories and there was a real predominance within IBM for yellow blue people, creative analytic. Swedish. The green were the <laughs> structural spreadsheet people, and the red were the emotional people who could read emotions. When they finished my results, they told me five jobs that I'd be particularly well suited for. And at the age of 45, I had already had four of those jobs. It was hysterical. But what do you think the typical CEO profile is for emotion, analytic, creative, and structural? Say that again. Emotional. No, no. What, before that. Oh, CEO. They, they, CEO. CEO. They, okay. They've done. You know, and say the four again. Structural emotional, analytical, creative. I'm gonna go for emotional. 
the trick okay. question. Yeah, I would. They're weak, they're weak, they're mediocre in all four. Huh? I would. So the point was that they knew a little bit about how different people think, but they also understood very well that other people are much better at all four of these attributes. Yeah. So as Gil said, they were flexible enough to listen and learn and yet informed enough that they could understand what they were being told. I mean, somebody like me, who is like a zero when it comes to structure, you know, just can't organize my socks. Um, you know, I, I just can't understand somebody who enjoys doing spreadsheets. <laughs> but a CEO who's a four, I mean, at least they have a little understanding of how that works. My, my late wife used to used to bust me all the time for the organization of my sock draw, Mike. I just had to share that. <laughs> in, in, in which I wish that were my, my least, my smallest problem. <laughs> I see you've been waiting. Yeah, so can you hear me? We can. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, have we wandered into an agenda that we don't really want to be in? I lost that. Have we wondered where? I don't think we've wandered into an agenda. I think we have spent 25 minutes on the first topic on the agenda. We're waiting for a second one. And I, I would like to hear from Pai if she's got a, a topic to, uh, to to dive into, too. I mean, there's there's so much going on right now. But if you have an idea, go forward, Doug. I, I'm going to uh, protect her a little bit. I told her she didn't have to speak if she didn't want to. Uh, she's from Malaysia. She's a graduate student in economics and humanities. One of my favorite people at Carnegie, Elena Noor, is from Malaysia as well. She's in our oh. Asia program. So she can either stay or not. And I'm going to Malaysia in uh, in uh, October. So I just turned down a speaking gig in Malaysia in October. Oh, actually, no, it's September. September. It's it's not in the main part of Malaysia though. It's in Sarawak. It's on oh. the island of Borneo. Back to you, Doug. I'm sorry, I'm distracting. No, that's, uh, I just wanted to raise the question as to whether we've got ourselves an early lockdown on an agenda that we aren't really that interested in. Doug, your audience is pretty good. Like any, any agenda for this group works out just fine. Yeah. Doug, I don't know what it is, but your audio is really crumbly compared to how it usually is. Well, is that better? Yep. How's that? Wait, much that's better. better. That's much better. Okay, I, I've got to get rid of my earphones. Yeah. Uh, so I was saying that have we wandered into an agenda we don't really want to be in? But with this group, maybe any agenda works. Yep. We're, we're, we're waiting for agenda item two. I could throw out a couple, but. Well, I've got one. Okay. Uh, but mine not be, might not be popular, and that is, uh, put it this way, with the end of the world coming, what are we going to do? Do we have an opportunity to create a culture around this event? Mm -hmm. Should I wait till Ken asks, what do you mean we, or should I ask? <laughs> <laughs> whose, whose world exactly is ending? Right, exactly. <laughs> that reminds me of the... Of the, old, of the old family. joke. Does anybody remember the old joke about the Lone Ranger? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what do you Who's mean? we, white boy? <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean, we? <laughs> Kimo Sabi. <laughs> Speaking of jokes, did you hear the joke that Zelensky told when he was, uh, I'm trying to remember where he was. It, was at one, it wasn't at the NATO meeting, it was just before he left for the <laughs> And he, he told the story of uh, two old Jews in Odessa were talking. And one of them said to the other, did you hear that Russia attacked NATO? And the guy goes, yeah, what happened? And he said, well, 70 million Russian soldiers dead or injured, thousands of tanks and vehicles burned up. It's a total disaster. And then the guy goes, well, what, what about NATO? And, he, and the first guy says, well, well, well they haven't shown up. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, wow. oh. 
And in, that minute, in that minute, I knew that that guy was one of the top five leaders of the 21st century. <laughs> <laughs> the multiple layers in that joke are stunning. Oh, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And he, you can watch it. I mean, it's 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 in translation, but it's a, yeah, it's, but a, still, it's a great it joke. The guy's a master, Peter Peter Zion, who is a geopolitical analyst who I follow a lot, <clears throat> um, uh, says that the that the characteristic military strategy of Russia for hundreds of years has been to throw bodies into the breach. Yeah, and That's practice the the scorched earth, like, you know, scorched earth body, policy yeah. when they leave, or you know, if they have to withdraw, scorched earth. Um, yeah. I, I yeah. don't know about you, Doug. I'm very depressed about the global warming, climate change news, and partly because I've been reading it for 35 years. But to see Putin doing what he's doing and to see the power of having you know, $500 billion at your disposal, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's horrifying. Yeah. And, so and it's, not just, it's not just, you know, he's not a unique example we've got north korea which is siphoning off half a trillion dollars in, mm -hmm. in money through cyber crime mm -hmm. actually no that's wrong it's it's like a billion that's only about a billion but still you can build nuclear weapons with a few billion dollars and we've got the saudis able to buy whatever they want they're, they're trying to buy half of the sp professional sports teams here in washington uh, watch, watch the um, the oh god, what is it called? It's like the War for Football. It's on Apple TV. It's a four part brilliant documentary series about the Super League. Oh, uh, which speaks to that question very much. So, Mike, and which but, which you know, uh, which uh, channel was it on? Apple TV. It's called Super okay. League: The War for Football. Okay. I believe is the title of it. It's it's brilliantly made. I don't know how they managed to pull it off in the midst of this you know global intrigue. Yeah. But, you know, as you talk about Putin and um, Korea and Saudis, I also think about Musk and Bezos and, um, you know, very, very, very wealthy people who can do whatever they want. And, who, and Zuckerberg. And Zuckerberg, who think they are smarter than they are. Yep. But they're yeah. going to have a cage match. So it's all cool, man, because, right. you know, that's right. going to decide who's the best, right? Cage and that goes match with a ruler, to with a ruler question. Can. That goes reason. back to that question. How do you get a, a, a focus on the global community when these guys can make these decisions? And it's, it, it really is. It's, it, it's, it's so scary. Yeah. And, and that, you know, know. From reality, and Musk in particular, I, I, my theory is he's doing some kind of drugs like, or, or, has, <laughs> or he is some kind of drug. <laughs> well, that's also definitely true. He is definitely a cult leader. <laughs> Yeah. So I want to I want to I'd love to take this back to to Doug's thought about, you know, a topic. How does this relate to, you know, what I what I would call, you know, creating a world that works? Mm -hmm. And I think I think that there are there are, you know, all of these folks are driven by uh, driven, driven by um, ego, weak ego at some level. That they're trying to prove their dominance in the world, especially Putin, and 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 we're just blowing the place up, you know. So where I'm coming to is that, nah, we've got to destroy, or or we will destroy this beautiful planet in some ways, and the species that currently exists, and the 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 hope or vision for the future is what we create after there is a level of huge, huge calamity, because all of these things are just pointing in the direction of destruction, 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 destruction. And yes. everybody everybody is acting out of their own, quote, self-interest. And, you know, and I realize that there are, there are islands of sanity that are percolating in so many places um, without a huge level of coordination. But I don't know that we're going to actually um, kind of get a critical mass of, mass of that bubbling up before things just, you know, kind of fall apart in a way that we can't even predict right now. I don't know. That, that's that, that's some of my current, my own current thinking for whatever it's worth. Mm -hmm. 
Doug, is, Doug asked a different question than how do we get to a world that works? He asked the question, <laughs> how do we deal with the world that's coming apart? But to paraphrase you, Doug. And, and yeah. Mike, Mike brought something up that I'd actually like to talk about, which is this group tends to be very serious and very cognitively focused. And Mike said, I'm really depressed by the news. And I'd like to talk about how people are feeling about what's going on with the planet heating up and what, and with all these things falling apart. Because I think that often gets shunted. Out. Let's not talk about our feelings. Let's talk about, focus on results and what we can achieve and what's our opportunity. And it's like you know, it's right now. I am incredibly distraught. You know, looking at what's happening, how fast things are are moving, how quickly things are heating up, the storms, the the droughts, the fires, all that stuff I listed the other day. Where do we go to talk about this? OGM is not a place we've traditionally talked about that. We tend to go, well, well, let's analyze this. And, you know, it'd be just nice to hear what other people are feeling right now. I feel because like like Mike, I've been watching this for over 35 years. Right. This is not news to me. But the fact that it has suddenly gone up to an order of magnitude or maybe three or four orders of magnitude, it's terrifying. I have existential angst and dread in my life. Very present. I don't have a lot of people to talk about that with. So if that's something people on this call would be interested in, I'm right there. If not, I understand it's a very hard thing to talk about. So just put that out. There are two of us, three of us, it looks like. I I, I, I look at it. Four. Four. <laughs> I, I look at five, it. Five and one abstention. There is the uh there there is the fact that I see a lot of it through my daughter who's 26. And just to see the assumptions that she's making about the future and to hear the reports from what her friends are saying. I mean, she's very well educated on these issues and um, it's it, no one's offering her some way out. I mean, I mean, there's there's all these tokenist things you can do, right? You know, bring your bring your own bag to the um, uh to the grocery store right but that doesn't seem to uh get at the problem that the amount of ice around the antarctic region is smaller than it's been in a very long time and and uh, greenland is melting faster than it's melted in years but i i i see this in the politics and i, and I was going to actually try to narrow this down to a topic that i've been thinking about and it ties together the what do we how do we deal with the crises that are piling up and how do we get people to look to the future in a more coherent way and and and, the, and it's weird that i'm going to ask this question but the united nations is preparing for the summit for the future in uh in 1994 and they are seriously inviting comments on what the UN could be or should be. And I'm thinking of writing a you know three-page thought piece on how the United Nations has to completely rebrand itself. And so rather than United Nations, which emphasize the organizations that are responsible for a lot of the bad policies and corruption and concentration of wealth, we rename it. And either it becomes UP, United People, or PU, People United. Somehow, you know, you just lay it out there and say, this is about a global organization that coordinates and supports rather than talks all the time and attempts to impose you know, global solutions on people through their government. And then there's probably four or five, you know, kind of policy, radical policy proposals that go with that. You know, one of them is unfettered access to an encrypted internet. Another is um, more transparency so we can get rid of some of the corruption. There, there could be some, you know, some core principles of this new idea. But somehow if we could... <laughs> take this community of six people and turn it into a global community of six billion people and unleash the potential of all that talent and time. I mean, that would be, that would be quite an energizing concept, particularly if it allowed small groups to organize and, and tackle global problems on a local level. I mean, I, I, can, I can write the speech, 
you know, you can write this incredible speech, but you have to have somebody who can deliver it with credibility and consistency. And you have to take on the fact that there are all these governments who like having power. But anyway, that's that's Mike Nelson's you know, thought. And if maybe I'll just write the piece and throw it to all of you and you can tell me why I'm completely delusional. But I like united people because it's up. Yeah, no, write, 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 the, write the piece, Mike, but write it fast because you said this, the Summit for the Future is in 1994. So you have to really accelerate your writing to break, yes, to break the light speed barrier. Yeah. Get that yeah. Um, a UP, not PU for obvious reasons. So at least in, in, in this culture. Um, well, well, we have to check and see how it sounds in French and Spanish and Chinese. Exactly, all that stuff. Uh, but write, write, it, write it and then we can figure out who's the person to deliver it. Um, on, on the question, no, that's, yeah, that's a real quick intervention, I think. Okay. Because I want to respond to Ken, but go ahead, Doug. Okay, the, the idea that there is a solution, uh, I've given up on. But if you go to a funeral, there's the opportunity for great orations. Maybe that's where we are. And we've got to celebrate what this party has been in a way that's meaningful to all the participants. It's a different task than let's try and engineer our way out of this, uh, which by the way, I think is impossible because CO2 is going to continue to rise, temperatures are going to continue to rise, and we have no procedure for stopping it. So we're moving towards a, a word that I heard this week for the first time, the venusification of Earth. Uh, that is the venusification oh, yeah. of Earth. And that uh, it, we're going to dry up and heat up, and that's going to be it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what about uh, funeral orations? Pericles in Athens. That would be a powerful op-ed. That would be a powerful op-ed. Over to you, Gail. Um, once again, too many things flying by to respond cogently, but I guess the, the general point is to pick up on the question of the existential dread, I guess, Ken, is, is maybe how you put it. Um, I've been finding, um, so I'm I'm sharing it. I've been I've been a congenital optimist most of my life. I'm always a glass half full. What's the possibility in this mess kind of person? Um, and um, and as I watch events now, I feel myself uh, much more shaken often, um, both with the with the with the you know un unraveling of democracy such as it's been on the one hand, and the pace of the climate breakdown on the other hand. And I've, I've known for decades that this was coming, but the what feels like an accelerating pace of breakdown in the last year or so is kind of staggering. Um, and, um, you know, and, and some people are freaking out by it and some people are saying, don't talk about it. I mean, Flor F Fireman's Fund just became the fourth insurance company to exit the Florida market. And the DeSantis response is, oh, there they are being woke. I've got a call. I've got a doctor call. I got to take. I'll continue later. Sorry, guys. Carry on. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'll 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 pick up on that. Um, and I too have been following for, for 35, 40 years, both in an organizational context and in a a climate context. Um, and I think I had the good fortune 30 years ago to all of a sudden um, step into Buddhist thinking and Buddhist philosophy. Um, and just a little, little brief story. <clears throat> I'm staying in the Marriott Hotel in Atlanta. And I this, this is in 19, around 1995. And um, I decided to look in the night table draw, expecting to see the Book of Mormon given the, the Marriott family. And the Book of Mormon was there, <clears throat> but in addition was the Book of Buddha. <laughs> and it was all about Buddhist philosophy. And I said, well, this is interesting. I wonder who left this book here. <clears throat> And as I'm walking in the hall in the hotel, I see that there's a stack of the Book of Buddha on the chambermaid's cart. 
So I felt a, a license to, to take it. And I, I have been in and out of, and especially over the last eight years, you know, deeply entrenched in, in, in Buddhist thinking, the work of, you know, um, Chogun Trumka and Shambhala warriors trying to preserve humanity. But the whole cosmology has made me um, in some ways, you know, in it, but not of it. And I, I, I've, I've gotten to the point where I'm just observing the craziness that's going on in politics and in climate and in world government and in war. And it's like, you know, this epidemic of insanity that's going on. Um, so how am I feeling about that? Um, there's a there's a sadness. There's a there's a you know there's a deep sadness. But picking up on Douglas on Doug's Doug's notion of of you know one of the Buddhist thoughts is everything has a beginning, middle, of an end. And though we thought we were in a flowering, you know, <laughs> this will be lovely going forward. We seem to have cooked the golden goose, and maybe it is time for a a funeral um, and a saying goodbye and. Who knows what would what would emerge out of that? You know, uh, Mike, I love your thoughts about what I call reimagining America. You know, it was an ideal created, you know, way back when, but it needs to be updated because that world no longer exists. You know, it's like I laugh when 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 the Supreme Court of the U.S. talks about originalist thinking. <laughs> How can you fucking rely on a 250-year-old document in a world that was just so incredibly different. And this is the pronouncements of the law of the land. It's fucking insanity. It's it's insanity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just came back in hearing Stuart screaming, it's insanity. It's insanity. <laughs> in right you didn't miss anything then. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I and stupidity. Know. I'll add stupidity to the mix, also. Okay. <laughs> yeah. There, well, yeah. So to to where I was when I when I left. So Fireman's Fund has exited the Florida market, uh, and the DeSantis government is denouncing them for being woke, <laughs> as opposed to having actuaries who do math. Okay. <laughs> Florida is the state which outlawed the use of climate change or sea level rise in any official government documents about North, what North fifteen Carolina. years ago. North so. Carolina was the first one to do that. You cannot discuss it in planning documents. So you've got this incredible, insane denial going on on the one hand. You've got people starting to feel like deer in the headlights of, oh, shit, what do I do? Um, and, um, um, you know, I mean, my prediction on this is that at some point when the shit hits the fan, the Republicans start blaming the Democrats for climate inaction. But that's what. Yeah. Well, for, for distorting the market, it's if the free market could have solved this problem and the Democrats got in the way. Yeah, the, yeah, the free market with uh, fossil fuels subsidized to the tune of, you know, three quarters of a trillion dollars a year. Yeah, right. Yeah, free market. But in some truth, it, there's some truth to it. I mean, the, the fact that we don't have a safe and a more affordable nuclear uh, industry, energy industry yeah, is because, because so many conflicting goals that... Um, we, we, we didn't we didn't develop the technology properly yeah I'm, i i would disagree with you on that for well part of the problem was is we had all this nuclear navy technology that wasn't well suited for nuclear power plants but because we had all this experience and all these navy engineers that was the first generation of nuclear power plants and fair that's enough. fair enough and look the french have done a better job than we have Clearly, but there, but there are two fundamental problems in that game. One is the nuclear fuel cycle, you know, like the, the inherent risk of, of managing the nuclear fuel cycle. The other, it, and we're starting to see this now in France, is that a thermal technology needs cooling. And cooling needs surface water delta T, and they do not have that. And was it three years ago, four years ago, France powered down their reactors in the summer because they couldn't cool them. And they're facing that again today. And that's true of any any thermal technology. So all the fossils and all the nuclear face that risk in a heated world. Uh, and nobody talks about that. And then you got grid instability. So there's a bunch of structural problems that are not free market problems per se. I, I would say they're partly concentration of power and, and distorted markets by subsidy. Because if the fossils aren't paying their freight, 
they get a free ride. And, um, and, and then you get Saudi Arabia. Yep. So. so I want to present a different view, and that is it's in human nature to produce more babies and to make more connections. And the two together are lethal because they weave a structure which becomes incapable of change. So here we are uh, with something that was inevitable. It's interesting. And it suggests that the best place to live is not at the end of a civilization, but in the middle. Um, no, no and yes, Doug. Uh, yeah, that's the best place to live. Or maybe at the beginning could be fun also. Uh, but the impetus to have more babies is breaking down. And a number of major countries, again, according to our friend Peter Zion, are facing demographic growth, yeah. including China. And nature's taking care of that as well with the uh, huge drop off in male fertility in the last 50 years. Yeah, but what you re what you result in is a demographic is a demographic pyramid that doesn't look like this, but that looks like this, and so you do not have enough young people to support the older people in the population. Okay, so that scenario takes us down to about six billion. It's still way too many. Well, you you know how takes us down to six billion over decades. You want it to go faster, Doug, don't you? Well, within a, a decade or two. And I just don't think we have the time. And I do want to argue that it's in our nature to have gotten ourselves in this jam. Well, it's in the biological nature of every living being to reproduce. Yes, exactly. Um, so they all go um, to the point where they things. break down. Well, I, I studied population biology some back in my youth, and the 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 the, the breakdown can be catastrophic, you know, you know, uh, we'll, uh, uh, sigmoid, sigmoid curves rising and crashing, or they could be, you know, there, there, there's this curve and there's, and there's this curve, which is the more natural one, so the sigmoid, and then there's the crash. And those are the options, right? The third one's most likely, given the breaching of the planetary boundaries that are going on. It's not just global warming, but if you look at the planetary boundary work coming out of Stockholm, where we've breached seven out of nine. I mean, how much more can this take before it and all reason, comes crashing the reason, down? The reason that sigmoid happens is that boundaries constrain the growth. It could be predator-prey relationships. You get to, you know get too many deer, the cougars eat a lot more deer, and there's less deer. Yeah, uh, I think that's based on stable conditions. We're talking about we're in. Well, let me let me, we've never been before. Let me go a little further. Um, the the breaching of the planet, planetary boundaries is that we've used our technology to overcome boundaries in the short term. So it's like it's like you build a fence to hold off the cougars, and you build a taller fence to hold off the cougars, and at some point they you know at at some point you have a lot more cougars than you were ever prepared to deal with. So the, yeah, but the capacity the, exas exacerbates the problem to your point, Ken. Yeah. The cougars and the antelopes uh, never went into a, an exponentially rising curve uh, past the center of equilibrium. But we humans do, uh, through weapons and technology, exactly. have created escalations exactly. that are new in nature and that we have no control over and they're gonna kill us. But the complaint that we could have done something, I think is wrong. I agree. Well, I, I, well, but Doug, the, the, the could have done something is the last 50,000 years of human history. The can't do something is the last 500. Well, I'm saying it's, it was built into our nature from the beginning. And what's amazing, if you go back and read ancient history like Mesopotamia, there were armies with fifty, with half a million soldiers and 200,000 dead in a single day battle over and over again. Uh, it's been very difficult for a long time. Hmm. Well, there is no planet B, so now what? Yeah. Time for a eulogy. Yeah. Creative. Yeah. That's you still and, a good story. You, you yeah. and Mike got some speeches to write. Yeah. yeah. Well, so I have I a know. candidate to uh, to give the eulogy. Um, I posted a couple Carnegie talks. Uh, one of them is happening right now mm. about the very topic. It pertains to a Nature magazine 
uh, article about uh, safe boundaries for the earth and you know why we seem to have gone beyond what uh, the the climate system can can sustain. Um, but the the thing I point you to is what happened two days ago. Adam Tooze, T O O Z E, who is one of the most articulate mega thinkers that I've heard, and who now is a fellow at uh, at Carnegie, he spoke with our president uh, Tino Cuellar, oh. and um, they had quite a conversation about everything from climate to China to Ukraine to um, you know talent and artificial intelligence but if you if you have a chance at least watch the last seven minutes <clears throat> because it goes directly to what's really going on with climate and and what really is needed you know the, the drastic changes in our systems and then it talks about China and its role and uh, it, it, it he really I mean the whole thing is worth watching but that last seven minutes uh, is is really pretty special. I also put a link to the nature paper, which I think a lot of you have probably heard about. But I'm optimistic. Uh, you know, the Harvard professor found that there's you know evidence of an extraterrestrial spaceship from beyond our solar system. And <laughs> we just have to wait for it to show up and see today. Well, wait, why is that? Remember make Fermi's paradox. <laughs> I, well, that's, that's exactly right. I think he's playing on that, but he, he's he got a huge amount of coverage for this. I, he, he, there was a big meteor off of Papua New Guinea, and they went looking for the debris on the ocean floor, and they found all these very peculiar little spheroids, spherules, <laughs> the result of molten metal kind of raining through the atmosphere and falling to the ocean floor. And some of it was pretty weird. I mean, it was uh, there, there's a debate. I, I put up a skeptical analysis of what was really going on. But you know, he got he got on all a lot of the major talk shows and news shows basically saying that you know this this is unexplainable. You know, maybe maybe there is something going on. Mike, it's Mike, a, Mike, why does that I, make a couple of years ago detected this long <laughs> meteorite that looked more like a cigar than a regular uh spherical or or semi-spherical meteor and um again it was uh oh it must be a spaceship from another another galaxy yeah. mike why does why does space chumps make you optimistic when they're actually all just coming here to harvest us and eat us well my theory is that we're actually part of a a, a, a truman show kind of sitcom that the extraterrestrials have been watching for at least ten thousand years yeah um when does it get funny yeah <laughs> right. there, was a, there was a i don't know it's been, there's certainly been some good plot twists some of which <laughs> yeah and the tweets the tweets yeah. that's what it's all about maybe, maybe these extraterrestrials eat tweets yeah the, my favorite line is uh neil degrasse tyson you know who talks about people visiting from other planets looking for intelligent life you know, and his response was, yeah, or oh, they came and they didn't find any signs of intelligent life and they left. Um, yesterday, there was a report on the PBS NewsHour about the results of the, is it the Gibb telescope? The web. The web, the, web, oh, the web telescope. Seeing seeing stars, new stars being born mm -hmm. and created like, you know, 100 billion life years away. So eventually, you know, um, there will be other stars with perhaps the capacity for human life. But one of the places that I that I went to in my reflections, cogitations, meditations, um, was all of a sudden Atlantis came up. Now, I've never drilled down into that, whether it's purely science fiction or whether there's, you know, some but evidence of this used by all types of military, Sorry. all types of governments, all types of corporations for all types of purposes, achieving narrow goals, externalizing. Me, I apologize. We're not okay. So I don't, my I don't, fault. right, no worries. So I don't know if Atlantis is just, you know, a piece of science fiction or, um, uh, or has some documented, you know, evidence of the existence, but okay. Um, all of a sudden it was like, you know, when Doug talks about a, you know, a funeral, it, it, that's what popped up as you know 
just another layer in the archaeological record. And we think of ourselves as, as so important in, and, 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 you know, based upon results, uh, we haven't been very good stewards of this planet. There is an amazing book called Noah's Flood by mm -hmm. Bob Pollard, the guy who found the Titanic. And he documents what happened about 10 to 12,000 years ago when the sea level started rising and the Black Sea Basin, which had been cut off from the Mediterranean and had dried out, suddenly reconnected to the Mediterranean. And for two or three years, there was this massive flood of water going through the Bosporus Straits and refilling the Black Sea. Mm. And it's absolutely fascinating because they, they took their submersibles and were able to find all these uh, remnants of prehistoric houses on the bottom of the Black Sea. Mm. And uh, it, it really seems like this was some myth that was rooted in this incredible catastrophe 20,000 years, 10,000 years ago. And there, it's not just the Bible, it, the same myth shows up in Northern Iran and in the Ukraine, where the Ukraine is. I mean, there's a bunch of, of, of reports of the great flood and um, this, this happened. I mean, it also happened in, in Eastern Washington at 40 times at the, at the end of the, the last ice age. I don't know that there's any Native American tales about that. But uh, it, it, it's growing up in Seattle, I spent some time in eastern Washington, and you can see these incredible um, 12 foot high ripples. And they're not made of sand, they're made of, of softball sized boulders or, or mm. cobbles. Mm -hmm. And there, there was water moving 150, 200 miles an hour across eastern Washington, 20 times the flow of the, uh, of the Mississippi. Mm. Because huge lake covering a third of Montana mm -hmm. had formed after an ice dam had blocked all the drainage. And then the ice dam melted enough that it floated away and all this, all this water came out. And then it happened 39 more times. So, yeah, we're, we're, we're living in a relatively catastrophe free time right now. This is where I find an an odd bit of comfort in the middle of the chaos. Uh, when I zoom out from, from a weekly, monthly, annual kind of rhythm to a centuries and eons rhythm or mm. geological time rhythm and just you know realize that I, I've lived in this 70 year, very unusual 70 year period in modern human history um, with, you know, with a sense of progress and advancement in all kinds of ways. Uh, and in fact, uh, you know, I was, I was, I was, I was doing, I was doing hand graphs before, you know, the history is much more like that. I'm not as smooth as I'm making it, but lots of ups and downs over the grand sweep of time, and it will happen again. And there is no permanent solution to it. There is no way of having that steadily go in one direction or another. And it's, uh, like I said, it's, it, 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 it's, it's weird. It's not comforting. It's weirdly comforting. Um, it's not, it, it doesn't make me any happier in 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 terms of what we're facing but sort of calms me down and it's easier because we don't have kids and grandkids ourselves we're not like panicked about what happens to to a personal next generation uh, but a social next generation very much and in very pragmatic terms you know how do jane what's it going to be like for jane and i to live out the rest of our lives if there are various collapses on the way um, and so back to, you know, Doug, you talk not just about eulogy, but how do we prepare? No fucking idea. Well, the question that emerges is how, in fact, precisely are we going to die? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, is it migrant wars, temperature, starvation, bullets? Uh, that's something I've never seen anybody talk about. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you, Doug, for raising that because um, at the beginning of the of the pandemic, when we were first kind of isolated, 
um, and everything was quiet, I, I had this great sense of, you know, um, being in a dystopian universe, you know, part of the part of the imagery in my own mind, and this this may sound um, racist or culturally unaware in some way, was you know, folks from from um, Oakland invading the island of Alameda, <laughs> and and kind of kind of taking over this you know bucolic place that I live in called you know Happy Town. Um, which was just thinking about the, the same kinds of things that, that you just raised, Doug. You know, how will this all kind of um, roll apart? And so in some ways, I live with the fact that, oh, you know, one day my bank account might completely disappear. Yeah. Um, one day um, there could be invaders. Um, one day, you know, there will be no food in the supermarkets. Um, all of this as as possibility. So flipping back to what Gil raised in terms of things being cyclical, not being kind of totally linear, um, you know, a bunch of my work is based upon, so what happens after conflict? You know, what what happens? What's the new emergence or creation? And, and part of my own... Um, way of, of 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 moving through that you know in the in, in in buddhist studies and i'm sure it's true in all religions you know after the physical body dies um you know there's a a a, a place of, of bardo and you know perhaps the spirit lives on and there's a level of reincarnation now is there proof of that absolutely not except that we it, it, yeah, absolutely not. There's no proof. A number of years ago, um, a, a famous neurologist, neuroscientist wrote a book called, called Proof That There's a, uh, a Life Beyond. And, you know, I read it through a kind of a, a lawyer's brain and there was there was no proof. It was only his, you know, articulating that he had a beyond experience, but proof, nah, fantasy. So I don't know, in some ways, that's what, um, that's, the, that's the, the, the frame that just keeps me going, that and the notion of, um, of you know. Do but what AI being used by all types of militaries, all types of governments, all types of corporations. You know, you're listening to Schmackenberger, I think. <laughs> I went to the link and he just started talking. <laughs> It's on my list to, to read. It's come through a number of multiple sources recently about, about AI, and I just I, I, I trust his thinking on it. Anyway, you know, this whole notion of living with with that in mind and, and the fact that, you know, we are just little specks, you know. We're all we, we think of ourselves as doing important stuff, but we're just little 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 specks in the universe that's all mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. so now that we're all cheered up what should we have on our <laughs> like, i don't know if you can hear us your video is frozen mm -hmm. <laughs> that's his internet challenge yeah well luckily i haven't been cut off yet but uh, well it's we your face looks time. good though it's not like really some bad expression so you know no, it's, it's, it's about five times <laughs> about five times it was tideous so i, I, I so i i want to go to to something that was brought up earlier um i think we really need to move beyond us and them beyond Republicans and Democrats, beyond, you know, these people are doing this to us and these are the enemies. Like, because there's only, one, you know, there, there are, there's one species, there are many peoples. And I think this is one of the challenges I think a lot of people face is, you know, the, the Gnostic move is to get up above everything and say, we're all one, we're all one up here. Can't you see that? But down here on the ground, we're not one. We are different. And there are people out there who other people say you don't deserve to exist and we're going to take you out of the picture. And that is a really big challenge. That is that is where we're actually is in us and them because they're a small minority, but they, they exert enormous influence. And if we're going to, uh, oh gosh, let me find this thing. Just um, 
I just got this yesterday. Um, hold on a second. Um, anybody know, everybody ever seen Karl Popper's thing on um, intelligence? Back in the 1940s, philosopher Karl Popper came up with something called the paradox of tolerance. It goes like this. If everyone is tolerant of every idea, then intolerant ideas will emerge. Tolerant people will tolerate this intolerance, and the intolerant people will not tolerate the tolerant people. Eventually, the intolerant people will take over and create a society of intolerance. Therefore, Popper said, to maintain a society of tolerance, the tolerant must be intolerant of the intolerant, hence the paradox. I think we're up against that right now. How do we, how do we collectively cease tolerating the intolerance? Because right now, the intolerance is kind of taken over things. And in that regard, that is a really big challenge. I think the majority of people are good and caring and loving people, but there are people out there who have a very different view on things and they have enormous power at the moment. And that is just one of the many parts of the multipolar trap that we're in, um, where it feels like nobody can win because everybody wants their own way. So there's, if we're going to get out of this, we have to, and Schmachtenberger says this, there's nothing inherent in our biology that prevents us from accessing wisdom, but there seems to be something inherent in the way we've we've structured our civilizations to access wisdom because we focus all on intelligence and knowledge and acquiring things, and we take ourselves out of: is this a good thing to do? You know, is it a good idea to go to war? Is it a good idea to keep pumping CO2 into the atmosphere? That's the question of wisdom that that doesn't adhere to market strategies because market strategies says, no, we're making money, keep going, keep going, keep going. So how do we work with this, this parable of intolerance and this, this idea of how can we create wise societies as opposed to wise people or in addition to wise people? What would be an example of a wise society in human history, Ken? Well, if you look at indigenous cultures, those that are still intact, they would say, is this is this going to serve? Is this going to serve people? Is this going to serve our, our well being over the long term? A lot of people point to the seven generations thinking, and it always drives me crazy because most people that I hear talk about the seven generations say we have to think about seven generations in the future, as if these people were so wise that they could view 140 years in the future. It's because they recognize there's always seven generations. If you're a, if you live a long life, you'll know your great grandparents, your grandparents, your parents, your siblings, your children, your grandchildren, your great grandchildren. That's seven generations. So they say there's always seven generations. Therefore, when we make decisions, we have to figure out does how does this affect the very young? How does it affect the very old? How does it affect those in the middle? How does it affect the unborn? How does it affect those who have come before us? How does it affect the world around us? That's wisdom. Indigenous peoples lived with that for thousands of years. Yes. I'm not romanticizing that there's definitely indigenous peoples who were very terrible and who were, were enslavers and murderers. Look at the in Mesoamericans, right? I couldn't even stay in the, the Teotihuacan exhibit because I was getting physically ill. But look at the, the Algonquins. You know, we wouldn't even have the Enlightenment or, or America without the Iroquois Confederacy. But even right? there, Ken, the, the Confederacy came out of centuries of horrible violence and exactly warfare that they and, were able to transform. So that, exactly. It's not that it's not the noble savage story necessarily, but the human experience in transforming messes into you know, friendlier kinds of messes of which that's one example, and perhaps there are others. The dawn of everything, I think, steps into some of that territory. But, the, you know, but to, you know, to the questions that are swirling around here, I think, you know, looking at, looking for and, 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 and spending some time with those examples of transformation, not of perfect societies in the past, but of humans who have dealt with this kind of problem at their own scale and have, have come out differently somehow. That would be an interesting place to look. The Iroquois, uh, from the, the the story I got from from my indigenous teacher was that the Iroquois had slavery for thousands of years and it took a thousand years to rid themselves of it. And Chief Scanandoa said to Washington, Jefferson, and Franklin, "You're really screwing up here. You're allowing slavery. If you allow slavery, it will tear your country apart." We had slavery. It took us a thousand years to get rid of it. It's a stain on the human soul. It's an affront to human dignity. You cannot have a culture that allows slaves without dehumanizing the culture, and eventually it will fall apart of its own of, because of the, the corrosive nature of that. And the 
you know, they said, well, you know, we can't get the Constitution voted on it because the southern states won't allow that, so we're going to have to deal with it. Well, then we had the Civil War, right, 80 years later. So, you know, we still there have, are examples of, of people who happened. have overcome these very difficult things, but they're few and far between. But that doesn't mean they don't exist. And how do we moderns, how do we, con it's not moderns, how do we contemporary people, because modernity happened hundreds of years ago, how do we contemporary people grapple with that in, in effective ways? So go ahead, Doug. I want to come back to Stuart's comment about we are little people. Uh, I don't agree. Little is a comparison to something. <laughs> and I don't think there's anything to compare us to. We just are what we are with each other and our stories and our narratives. Uh, and bigger and littler doesn't fit because any kind of little can be treated as a big and so on. Yeah. So, so um, herein, in some ways, um, Doug kind of pushing back on, on, on me, which is just absolutely fine. But I think therein lies the, um, some of the rub we're facing. Uh, we talked a little bit about you know, wisdom before, wisdom societies. And in some ways, when I think about the word wisdom, I also think about humor, OK? Mm -hmm because there's so often there's there's humor in the idea of con con connecting different different little pieces that the mind suddenly grasps and 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 just starts to laugh so i think that that you know we've created a culture that in some ways is based upon you know cartesian logic <laughs> and when you when you talk about wisdom it's not often logical it's almost some leap of of faith, you know. I I'll use Einstein as an example, who's a great scientist, but he was also kind of a a wise ass guy. And some of his greatest, you know, contributions came from that 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 leap. And um and we've got to start accessing that kind of um um that that kind of thinking. It's not even thinking; it's presence. You know, we've gotten to the point where the thinking mind is so determinative of so many different things, the thinking analytical mind. And yet, when we talk about emotions, this this heart space and the intelligence of the heart, and of course, you know, heart math comes up as, as, as you know, someone who's kind of dug into this a bit. Yeah. So I think, Doug, that it's, it's both and. We're little and we're big. <laughs> we're big in this call. We all have a, a big presence in this call, but in the in the in the grander scheme of things, we're just, you know, little specks. We may be little specks, but we've completely remade the world. So that makes us pretty significant little specks. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're little and we're big, and uh, to something that someone said before, like the Zen monk would say, not not one, not two. You know, unified, separate. No, no, live in the paradox of that. Um, I'm very curious, uh, trying not to put you on the spot, but we haven't heard from you. Is there anything you'd care to say? Uh, we, there's been a lot of fast talking going on and hard to jump in, but I'm curious to know what's on your mind or what's being provoked for you in this conversation. Uh, after listening to this, I just uh, feel like I'm being ignorant. So uh, the dawn of everything will be my next book after Sapiens. It's a mm -hmm. it's a very it's a very provocative read, mm -hmm. very different than what most of us have have, have learned in our lives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have another salon that I do on uh, Tuesday. Uh, afternoons with a bunch of tech policy people and we got into a good discussion about movies that have been most influential in shaping people's view of technology and the future mm. and it was partly because I, I, I think I've mentioned I'm on the board of the Arthur C. Clarke Foundation who in the 60s and 70s got a lot of people to think 50 and 100 years into the future and I, I'm just curious if if people have time for you know one movie or two movies that they think are shaking up people's view of the future, we we had a pretty long list. Uh, Her, 
about artificial intelligence was definitely on the list. What's it? Dr. Strange Love obviously had a huge impact in this. <laughs> We're all of the, only one of us is not of that age. Um, but yeah, it was it was a fun it was a fun topic. So I'd, I'd be curious if anybody has some some odd ideas on this one. Or maybe we don't, maybe we aren't influenced by movies. We just laugh at them. Oh, I'm just trying to think. I, I see so many. Let's see. Uh, Mike, what was the first one you mentioned? You said Er? Her, H-E-R. Oh, her. Arnold Johansson plays the yeah, role yeah. of artificial intelligence built to write greeting, personalized yeah, greetings. I, I get it. I didn't, I didn't hear the silent H. <laughs> there was Sim 1 back in uh, with Al Pacino, like, 15 years ago, um, yeah. or Simone, I guess is the yeah. one way to say it, but a Sim one. Yeah. Um, and there was uh, Ex Machina, which yeah, I didn't that really care scary. for. Um, oh. Certainly 2001 was, was one. Actually, here's I saw a double feature 30 years ago of 2001 and We Came in Peace for All Mankind, which is a, a documentary by the Apollo Project. And they actually made a fantastic pairing. And one of the astronauts was saying that the only thing that that um, uh, Kubrick got wrong is that in space you don't see stars because you need an atmosphere in order to catch the light. So space is just black. The only thing you see is our sun and the planets that are reflecting the light. And everything else just blackness, um, which yeah. I thought was very interesting. Yeah. Um, um, Kevin Costner, Waterworld, mm -hmm. uh, critically critically pan. And I thought it was a very prescient uh, movie about what the future um, yep. would would be like. Um, I recently saw um, uh, Anderson's new movie, Asteroid City. Yeah. Um, which is, you know, as all his movies are, it's it's visually arresting and um, artistically impactful and um and then and then you've got to reflect on it to think about so what was he trying to say but it was it was a little bit like um to me like don't look up um mm -hmm. like the absurdity of of you know of what we're living in mm -hmm. but i think i think movies uh, have a huge 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 potential impact um, you, you know, if you could harness that that technology and stop making some of the dreck that 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 um, to use a phrase <laughs> to, to use an East Coast phrase, if you could stop using some of the the dreck that people are putting out with so much you know violence and destruction, um, it's a it's a media with huge potential power. To you don't want to see Rambo fourteen. <laughs> One of the most interesting comments was from a French friend who watches a lot of movies and always has the perfect YouTube clip to illustrate any point he wants to make. But he said, think about The Godfather, which in a way both glorified and humanized the mafia and mafia techniques and probably led almost directly to Sopranos 20 years later. And his argument was that particularly the Sopranos sort of normalized mafia family tactics. And that's why people aren't so surprised by what Trump is doing and Putin is doing. There's just this understanding that, well, people are inherently evil and they will grab what they can using any technique that they can. And it's it's a really different different thing than watching the uplifting movies of the 50s. Yeah. And you know, that wasn't the intention probably of the people who made this. Uh, it wasn't. Uh, I, I, I couldn't watch it. The I Sopranos? Watched, the Sopranos. I watched the first couple. I, I, you, as, as art, I loved it. I thought it was a brilliant, brilliant program. I just didn't want to spend my time with those people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, so I the, other, I, the other one is the, is, is the Simpsons. You know that the Simpsons taught 
three generations of young American kids to be totally insubordinate and smart ass. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 It's, it's also a, um, a wonderful vehicle for entertainment and escapism. It's like, I can't wait to go see the new Tom Cruise Mission Impossible movie. And, 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 and for entertainment and escape, I, I recently got into this um, prime series of Bosch about a detective, which is lovely and entertaining. And I've also decided to look into some of the critical reviews because it really raises a whole bunch of I think you know important issues that we we're we're grappling with as a as a society in terms of law and police and all of those pieces. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we don't have to worry about movies for a while because the writers are going on strike. So yeah, mm -hmm. the writers are on strike. The actors are on strike. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the other piece that's parallel, <clears throat> you know, is the recording industry and the amazing power of song. Um, you know, Jackson Brown has been a hero for 35 years talking about what's going on in the world in a most beautiful, um, poignant way, I think. Going to a concert of his is like going to a revival meeting, just beautiful, beautiful uh, uh, expression of a, a, of a wise guy who's observing what's going on in the world. We might not have concerts anymore now that the fans are throwing things at the performers. I mean, if you're an insurance company, would you insure Harry Style or Beyonce? I mean, Harry Styles got hit in the eye with some persons, but who knows what? I mean, they're throwing everything at these guys, people. It's just, it's insane. This isn't a movie, but it, it's, it's one of the best documentaries i've seen it's a series of six it's called light and magic it's on disney plus and it's the story of industrial light and magic and it is magical to watch this i mean it starts off with these geeky kids in the 50s and early 60s who got you know kodak movie cameras and they began to do their own special effects and they're it's really hokey and and then um Lucas brought them together, says, I want to create something I don't know how to create. And nobody did. They had to invent all this stuff. So when you see the battle cruiser, you know, um, in Star Wars, they couldn't run that. Uh, if, if it had been moving, the lights would have caused shadows. So what they had to do was invent a computerized tracking system where they could keep running it over and over again. It would just film the exact same thing and, and layered in so there were no shadows. Um, and it just, it, it was, it, I, I, I'm a movie geek. I really loved it. So Light and Magic, if you get a chance to watch that, it's just very, very fun and, and, and inspiring. Um, so that's, that's love, my recommendation for tech. So yeah. that, that would work well. Um, well, thank you for, for, for going that way. We have three minutes left. I, just, I have a poem. I was going to ask whether Ken had a contingency poem in case Before, we before the poem, shall we meet next week? Uh, Jerry's going to join us next week. He, oh, he's that's right. The message. week after. Yes. Yeah. So I'm 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 also curious about <clears throat> notice who showed up today <clears throat> in Jerry's absence. I don't know what that, if anything, <clears throat> means. All right. But just just a just a thought. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think right, the so people are we meeting next week or not? Who enjoy our company? <laughs> Jerry's with us next week. <laughs> Jerry's some with us now. Probably, some people probably joined and said, oh my God. Oh. <laughs> Jerry, yeah, Jerry's with us next week. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But thank and, you. Uh, Jerry, mm -hmm. Mike, if you, if you like documentaries, another really interesting one is Tim's Vermeer. Uh, it's yeah, yeah. Uh, Penn and yeah. Teller did this film. You saw it, right? Oh, it's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. One of yeah. The best things I I've saw ever. a different one in the theater about the making of the Vermeer exhibit. Um, I also just watched the documentary about with Mike Nolan, the director, about the Oppenheimer movie, just about the Oppenheimer project, um, which was uh, mostly a personality study about who Oppenheimer was. That was a, a, a I enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. eager to see the new movie. Yeah. But apparently, both uh, Asteroid City and Oppenheimer are sparking a surge in atomic tourism. 
<laughs> go to the White Sands uh, test site where they tested the Trinity bomb. You can go to Oak Ridge to see where they did a lot of the chemistry. Few people are even trying to go see Hanford Reservation, although that's pretty well fenced off because there's so much plutonium lying around. Yeah, I think it was about 20 years ago. I actually did a training at Los Alamos mm -hmm. uh, for the military, mm -hmm. which was kind of cool. Just going there and being there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I was lucky enough to go there a few times. It's uh, pretty magical. Mm -hmm. And I'm going down to Oak Ridge and uh, Knoxville in about a week. So that'll be it. Okay. Home time. I can't, so I think. So, so Gil asked me last week, says, you've never shared one of your poems. And there's a reason for that. Well, I, I'm not, uh, I, I might like to recite poetry. I don't find myself to be a particularly good poet, but I, I have a poem that I was, I had to write as an assignment. So this is, uh, and it seems to fit today. It's called Earth I Am. Earth I Am. I am Earth. Our bodies are one, yet differentiated. Laying on the ground, staring at the sky, the stars dance in all my cells. Earth minerals form my bones. Seawater courses in my veins. And the great winds leave their traces across the landscapes of my mind. As the earth rises to meet the sky, I bridge the two. My roots go deep. My branches are wide. With an eternal mystery glowing inside. Hmm. I think you wrote that for me. <laughs> I just, that resonates in 15 ways. I don't know if you're willing to send a copy, but I'd yeah, I'll, I'll put it up on the list. And, and, and I don't know how you knew what the topic for the first half hour would be, but I didn't. Oh, I don't. I never know. Uh, and that's, I, that's, yeah, wrote that, that's part ago. of the Ken magic, Mike. But that's, that's the magic of poetry. That is, no, that's the magic just, of Ken. It just shows up like that. Can did I ever, did I ever share with you guys the um, Robert, what Robert Bly wrote about poems? Uh, before, before you do, I just want to say that um, um, you're, you're not a very good critic of your own poetry. <laughs> you I appreciate not, that. If you think you can't, can't write good poetry, shut up and just write it. Because that was fine. That was really I fine. appreciate that. There were at least uh, eight or ten very powerful imagery yep. or i could hear the sound you know mm -hmm. so so i um robert Bly. anybody who knows anybody who knows the the book uh the magazine the sun mm -hmm. they have this back page of of this called sunbeam and it's quotes and i have this book of sunbeams it's all these quotes and i'm reading it a couple weeks ago and i find this by robert Bly, and it blew me away he says one day while studying a yates poem i decided to write poetry for the rest of my life i recognize that a single short poem has room for history music, psychology, religious thought, mood, occult speculation, character, and the events of one's own life. I still feel surprised that such various substances can find shelter and nourishment in a poem. A poem, in fact, may be a sort of nourishing liquid, such that one uses to keep an amoeba alive. If prepared right, a poem can keep an image or a thought or insights on history, or the psyche alive for years, as well as our desires and airy impulses. I'm like, who decides? I'm reading this poem. I'm going to write poetry for the rest of my life. <laughs> like, whoa, I wish I had such a destiny. And please, please send us that as well as your poem. I will. I will. All right. Uh, looks like we lost Doug. Anyway. I Absolutely. think, you know, I'm an open space facilitator and I really believe that whoever comes is the right people. So I'm happy to be here with, with all of you. It's been a lovely day and um, have, a, have a great rest of your day. You too. I agree. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.